all right so this is active filter design lecture 19 in the last class we were looking about uh, we were talking about uh, uh, noise in electrical networks with uh, the long term goal of being able to understand the concept of dynamic range which we know to be the ratio of the maximum signal level that the filter can process to the noise power coming out of the filter where this noise is being generated by the noise sources <coughs> internal to the filter right. Uh, so we need to understand what limitations uh, the transconductors have with respect to the maximum input voltage uh, which we decided was very dependent on where the transistors are hooked up in order to generate the voltage control current source and noise uh, which uh, is uh, a little less generic I mean it is more generic rather. Uh, so it pays to actually understand noise and how to make noise calculations in electrical networks. Uh, towards that end uh, I showed you uh, several pictures in the last, uh, uh, last class uh, demonstrating uh, various concepts that one might have known also giving a little bit of time domain intuition to the whole thing. So when we broke off in the last session what we said was that if we had a filter centered at which has pass band centered at F1 and F2 right and uh, we denote and if this particular filter H was being driven by a noise source with a uh, which was uh, whose spectral density was flat in other words it was white then one can think of the output as being equivalent to the same noise source driving two filters H1 and H2 and adding up their outputs. This is the noise source. Does this make sense? Correct? And we said if uh, this noise spectral density was uh, let us say uh, S n okay, which is a constant for all frequency. Please note that the spectral density the x axis must be frequency. What will be the mean square value of the uh, voltage there? No, no 4 kt the input has a spectral density S n this must be S n into the what is the uh, I mean okay so this corresponds to H 1 okay and this corresponds to H 2 alright. So what is the mean square value at the output of H 1 simply S n times 1 hertz similarly the output the, the mean square value of the waveform at the output of H 2 is S n 2 is S n times 1 hertz. So what is the mean square value at the output of the summer? It is simply twice S n which you obtain as uh, V n 1 square plus V n 2 whole square. Uh, the cross I mean it is uh, the technically the output mean square value is the mean square value of Vn1 plus Vn2 the whole square which uh, we saw the last time to be Vn square plus Vn1 square plus Vn2 square because the cross product Vn1 times Vn2 the average of that will be 0. Okay. Now if I added a gain here again G1 at the output of the first filter and again G2 at the output of the second filter what will be the mean square value of the voltage there? 
it will be s times s n times g1 square times 1 hertz and what about the mean square value here s n times u t square so what will be the mean square value of the output of the summer s n times g1 square plus g2 square does it make sense okay so how will the frequency response of a filter like this look like how will it look like it just means that the bandwidth is 1 hertz but this gain in the pass band is g1 and this gain is g2 does it make sense avinash yes okay all right so now we can generalize this result if you had multiple pass bands in the filter how would it generally look like what will be the mean square value of the output sn times g1 square times 1 hertz plus g2 square times 1 hertz plus g3 square times 1 hertz and so on so in general therefore if i took a noise source whose spectral density was like this and pass this through a filter so this is the filter this is the noise source okay and let's say this magnitude response is mod h of f correct so you have a random noise waveform driving a filter so now what is the so based on the discussion we had what is the output of the filter what will be the spectral density at the output of the filter so figure that out all that you need to do is consider some narrow band of frequencies a 1 hertz band centered at some frequency f the gain of the filter at that frequency is h of f correct so the mean square value of this band of frequencies when it comes out of the filter is sn times mod h of f the whole square times 1 hertz the mean square value of the entire noise waveform coming at the output of the filter is the sum of the mean square values of of all these things taken across all frequencies from 0 to infinity so in other words we figure out two things one is that the noise spectral density here is nothing but is nothing but mod h of f whole square times sn does it make sense all right all right now i mean please note that this is this is another noise source it's just that it is taken <coughs> Uh, so what we have done in this particular example is take white noise and pass it through a filter and get something at the output of the filter whose spectral density looks like this. Okay. Clearly here the uh, distribution of all frequencies is not the same. So what do you think you can call it? I mean you can see that some, some frequencies are emphasized more than the others and uh, this is called colored noise just like if you take white noise and just only pick or selectively emphasize one color the resulting light will look you know color right you understand so uh, this is the output noise spectral density and what is the mean square value of the output voltage so in other words we had white noise here 
with the spectral density s n of f which was a constant and this was mod this filter had a frequency response h of f the spectral density at the output is therefore s n of f times mod h of f the whole square and the mean square value of the noise waveform at the output of the filter is therefore you need to integrate this from 0 to infinity. All right. Does it make sense? Oh, well, uh, uh, see there are all right. So, now that we have got that out of the way, uh, the mean square value at the output of the filter is uh, integral 0 to infinity S n of f mod h of f the whole square times d f. And uh, uh, this relationship also holds both these relationships in other, uh, in fact, this as well as this both hold even when S n of f is not is not white. And for example, if I now took the output of the filter and passed it through another filter. What do you think with the mean square, uh, what will be, what do you think the spectral density will be at the output of that filter? The input spectral density, I mean again you go through the same reasoning, okay, I consider a narrow band of 1 hertz around a frequency delta f, the power in the noise source is uh, S n of f times h of f mod h of f the whole square, that goes through another filter h1 of f let us say, its gain around that frequency f is h1 of f. So, the spectral density at the output will be S n of f times mod h 1 square of f times mod h 2 square of f and uh, again uh, the addition of different frequencies to find the mean square no uh, noise will hold. So, the same relationship holds. Is this clear? So, the important thing is if you know the noise spectral density and you know the transfer function from the noise spec uh, from the noise source to the output. Right, which you can calculate, it is a network after all. So, you can calculate the transfer function from a given noise source to the output. Therefore, you can find the what? You can find the spectral density at the output of the network due to this particular noise source by, by taking the uh, spectral density of the noise source which is known right, and multiplying it by mod transfer function the whole square. That will give the noise spectral density at the output due to this particular noise source. The mean square value at the output due to this particular noise source will simply be the integral of the pass spectral density at the output from 0 to infinity. So, let me just quickly illustrate this using a very common example. I am sure several of you have, uh, have taken uh, other advanced classes have seen this before, but I will do it anyway for the benefit of those who have not done, done so. All right. So, uh, let me take a simple example. Let us say you have a first order RC filter being driven by some input signal. We are interested in finding the noise spectral density at the output of the RC filter as well as the mean square noise at the output of the RC filter. Why do you think there is noise in the first place? Because yeah. of the resistor, very good. To find the mean square value of the noise at the output, you have to replace the resistor with its appropriate noise model. In other words, we know that the resistor has a noise source Vn in series with it, the spectral density of Vn B. 4 KTR volt square per hertz. This is the capacitor. We are interested in finding only the response of the circuit to the noise due to the resistor. So, to that end, we say we, we do not really care about the input, we set the input to 0, right, and this is C. <coughs> This is the noise model for the resistor. 
All right. So we have a noise source, only one source in this simple example. And what is the transfer function from the noise source to the output? This is the output. Transfer function from Vn to V out is 1 by 1 plus SRC, but I mean is SRC what we are interested in or something else? J omega RC, but omega is also not what we are interested in, all our units are in hertz. Okay. So, J Two pi f r c. So, what is the noise spectral density at the output? Come on, people. Is S V n of f times mod h of f the whole square, which is four k t r okay divided by very good 1 plus 4 pi square f square r square c square and uh, how might this look if plotted How will this look? At DC it will be 4 KTR as F goes on increasing, it is falling off, right? And this makes sense because at DC the filter does not attenuate at all. So the noise spectral density of the resistor comes through directly. At high frequencies the filter filters. So the high frequency components of the noise of the resistor are attenuated. All right. If you want to find the mean square value of the output, mean square value of the <coughs> output noise is nothing but the integral of the spectral density over all frequencies, correct? And now it is time for some. Bf by 1 plus 4 pi square f square r square c square Correct? And how do you evaluate the integral? Uh, use uh, 2 pi rc times f as u. So, this must be the same as, so which means 2 pi rc df is du, which means this is equal to 4 k tr times u divided by 1 plus u square the limits of integration remain 0 to infinity and what must this be? So, the integral is pi by 2. So, the answer the mean square value is 4 ktr divided by 2 pi rc times tan inverse u evaluated from 0 to infinity which is pi by 2. So, the mean square value therefore all right. Why does this make sense? Okay, it comes out of the math all right, but can we get any intuition? First of all, it might seem a bit surprising that 
hey the uh, finally the noise source in the network is thanks to the resistor correct but it seems as if the value of the resistor doesn't matter at all the mean square output noise is simply kt by c quite independent of the resistor value so why do you think this makes sense pardon correct okay so as this makes sense because of the following as r increases the spectral density of the noise source increases however please recall that the noise is being filtered by the rc filter as r increases what do you think happens to the bandwidth of the rc filter it decreases so if uh, on one hand you have the spectral density increasing on the other hand the bandwidth is decreasing so in this particular example it just so happens that they cancel out exactly and the uh, mean square value at the output of the rc filter is kt by c okay you understand all right and uh, <coughs> earlier we said that if you took two identical filters and put them uh, you know in parallel what do you th uh, what will happen to the uh, mean square output noise so we took two identical filter networks and connected them up node to node in parallel it will come down by factor of how much it should come down by a factor of mean square value must go down by a factor of 2 yes no So some other. Now let's say you have uh, example two. Let's say you have two noise sources. For example, I'll take R1, R2, and C. All right. So, if you want to find the mean square, uh, I mean, let's try, first try and find the spectral density at the at the output. How will you find the noise spectral density at the output? You, re you de-energize the voltage source. You replace every resistor with the noise model. So, there will be a noise source Vn1. R1. What about R2? There will be Vn2. There is C. All right. Now, if you want to find the mean square, the noise spectral density, the output, what all are you supposed to do? Okay, so you need to find the transfer function from each noise source to the output. So, Vn1 to V out, what is the transfer function? How will you find it? Simply use superposition, right? So, uh, what is the Thevenin equivalent looking in across the capacitor? It is uh, Vn1, the Thevenin voltage source is Vn1 times R2 by R1 plus R2 and Thevenin resistance is R1 parallel R2. So, the transfer function is nothing but R2 by R1 plus R2 divided by 1 plus j 2 pi f r 1 parallel r 2 times does it make sense Alni Rakesh similarly what is the 
ट्रांसफर फंक्शन टू वी एंड टू टू वी आउट इंटरचेंज आर वन एंड आर टू वेरी गुड सो इट्स आर वन बाय आर वन प्लस आर टू वन प्लस जे टू पाई एफ आर वन पैरल आर टू टाइम्स सी सो लेट्स कॉल दिस एच एन वन दिस एच एन टू all right what can you say about vn1 and vn2 these are noise voltages occurring in different resistors so do you think there will be I mean, one knows what is happening in the other resistor nothing so uh, therefore vn1 and vn2 are uncorrelated uh, and they are also zero mean so average value of vn1 times vn2 must be zero since that completely uncorrelated if you take vn1 pass it through a filter right take vn2 pass it through another filter and if you look at the output waveforms of the filter then are they correlated or they are, are they not correlated do you understand the question vn1 and vn2 are uncorrelated so this a noise spectral density at the output is simply the sum of the spectral densities of <coughs> sum of the spectral densities at the output due to vn1 and vn2 which is nothing but s vn1 of f times mod hn1 of f the whole square plus s vn2 of f mod hn2 of f the whole square <coughs> correct okay now if there are 450 noise sources in the circuit what would you have to do first replace every element by its uh, uh, noise equivalent which basically means that uh, there are 450 noise sources in the circuit from each noise source to the output you need to find the transfer function right then if all those 450 noise sources are uncorrelated then the spectral density at the output is simply the sum of the spectral density due to the individual noise sources So, uh, multiplied by the mod square of the transfer function from each noise source to the output. So the procedure remains exactly the same. It just becomes a lot more tedious, which is why you can do all this on a computer, right? So when you uh, take a spice or a circuit simulator and say, you know, a dot noise or uh, perform a noise analysis of the circuit, in essence, what well, this is what it is doing. It is replacing every element with its equivalent noise source, finding the transfer function from every noise source to the output. finding the uh, therefore the spectral density right if there is if the noise sources happen to be correlated then what do you think will happen there will also be some cross terms right but fortunately in circuits work most of the times the there is either no correlation or the correlation is so small that it can be neglected so we are stuck with the happy situation of simply adding up the pass spectral densities at the output due to each of the noise sources does it make sense okay now uh the i mean uh, i uh, leave it to you as an exercise to work out the exact expression for uh, the noise spectral density but the mean square noise can be in this particular example can be calculated in a rather simple way right if i deenergize the input this is the filter correct so what would be the mean square value at the output this is please recall that we had said that if you had an rc network just now we said that if you had an rc network the mean square value at the output is nothing but kt by c irrespective of of r right 
So, I mean you can think of R as being made of two parallel resistors R1 and R2 and therefore the mean square value of the output of the filter that is here must also be independent of R1 and R2 it turns out to be equal to and should turn out to be equal to KT by C. So, if you go and plug all these expressions and play you will find that you must get KT by C if not made a mistake. Does make sense? All right. All right. Now uh, another simple example. You can uh, <coughs> so let's say you have a resistor and its noise source is represented by. some voltage Vn1 and series with the resistor. Okay. Now you can do many common I mean just like you can manipulate uh, voltage source in series with the resistor as a current source in parallel with the, uh, with the resistor one can also represent the noise of the resistor in this way all right. Uh, this is some noise source I n 1. What would be the spectral density of I n 1 given that the spectral density of V n 1 is 4 k T r volts square per hertz. Why is it 4 k T by r? Right away. I mean if these two are to be equivalent then if I put a voltmeter across these two terminals the mean square voltage must be the same as that I get when I put a voltmeter across the current source in parallel with the resistor. So, what is the mean square voltage here I mean in a 1 hertz bandwidth I get for this guy 4 k T r correct and uh, if uh, I n 1 had some spectral density S i of f. What is the output voltage in terms of the spectral density? What is the spectral density? What is the transfer function from I n 1 to the output voltage r correct? So, we know that if you take uh, something and pass it through a gain of g the mean square value of the output will be or spectral density will be input spectral density times transfer function square correct. Here the input quantity is S i of f the transfer function so to speak is r. So, the spectral density of the at the output across the resistor right of the voltage across the resistor is S i of f times r square and since these two are equivalent these two must be the same correct which means that S i of f is 4 k T by R ampere square per does it make sense or 4 k T G ampere square per all right. So, uh, therefore, let me now quickly summarize the general case where you have a network with many perhaps all right voltage noise sources and many current noise sources and let us say we are interested in finding two quantities. What quantities might we be interested in? This is the output port. We would be interested in finding the output sparse spectral density as well as the mean square output. So, the, the general way of doing this is to find the transfer function from every voltage noise source to the 
output let me so take the input noise spectral density of the kth noise source okay find the transfer function from the kth noise source to the output right and sum this over all the noise sources and do the same for the current sources so s i k of f times h i k of f whole square and this is the output noise spectral density what will be the units of this character quick whole square per hertz this guy dimension less this guy ampere square per hertz this guy ohm square correct all right and what about this character whole square per hertz and uh, it therefore follows that the mean square output noise is nothing but integral of the spectral density from 0 to infinite clear you understand <coughs> This is the uh, the procedure to be followed for any linear network with multiple noise sources. There is nothing more to it. You just have to find, uh, put a lot of grunge work into finding the transfer function from every source to every other to the output, right? Okay. All right. Now let's consider the special case of a of a filter. So now we know how to make these. In other words, given a filter network and given the noise model for each one of these components that make up the filter, in principle we have figured out a way of finding the mean square output noise of the filter, right? And if we know how large the input signal to a transconductor can be before the transconductor starts to do funny things, we also know that we will in principle also be able to predict the maximum input signal level that one can put in. So, with the, with, the, with the knowledge of the maximum input signal level as well as the mean square output noise, we are therefore in a position to predict the dynamic range of the filter. You understand? All right. So, uh, so far we have only seen the following elements, right? So, the resistor, we already know its noise model. This is a the equivalent. Capacitor is noiseless, okay. All right. And uh, the only other thing we have seen now is a transconductor. All right. And it turns out, so where do you think uh, the transconductor will inject noise? How can you model the uh, the noise in the transconductor? <laughs> Ideally, the, the current, the uh, transconductor is supposed to take in the voltage difference and push out a current which is GM times the input difference. In practice, because the stuff inside the transconductor is noisy, it will push out not only GM times V difference, which is what you want plus some noise that noise since uh, the output current is signal current plus noise current 
the model must be you must have a noise current source in parallel with the output current. Okay. All right. Now the details of how I n depends on on GM is again a function of how transistors inside the voltage controlled current source are hooked up in order to realize this transconductor. Okay. But one thing, so in other words, one cannot give give a generic formula for for I n in terms of G n. However, one can make the following prediction which is if I double G m what do you think uh, I n what will happen to I n? In other words, if I take two identical G m's of the same type, in other words, I copy and paste, correct? It is a copy and pasted version. So, whatever noise source is there in the first one, a similar topology with the same spectral density will be there for the second one also. So, if I connect both of these in parallel, what is it equivalent to? It is equivalent to a transconductor of value 2 g m and a noise source how much? 2 i. So, in other words, the spectral density, I mean, when I say 2 i n, what does it mean? Are you adding the currents or the spectral densities? You have to add the spectral density. So, let, let me uh, prevent confusion by saying if this was S i of f, this is also S i of f. So, what is the spectral density here? 2 S i of f. So, what do you think is a reasonable model therefore, uh, to use for this noise source? What do we see? If I put 10 GMs together, what will be the noise spectral density at the output? So, if I put, uh, uh, so in other words we see that the spectral density of the noise coming out of a transconductor, it is reasonable to assume that it is proportional to G n. You understand? Yes, Suvinay? From your study of the resistor, 4 k t by G, uh, 4 k t by R or 4 k t times G has dimensions of ampere square per hertz. And what are the dimensions of this? Ampere square per hertz. So, which means that 4 k t times transconductance has dimensions of ampere square per hertz. So, this constant of proportionality can be written as Palni Rakesh. This can be written as 4 k t times g m right times some other number which you do not know which you call eta. Yes, Avinash, you do not seem convinced at all. What is the problem? What is bothering you? So, now that we have considered uh, uh, a noise of this, let me just make a note here that this eta depends on on the way transistors are hooked up inside. In other words, it depends on circuit details. All right. Now, the last bit of jargon about uh, uh, noise. So, let us say we had a filter, right. Obviously, there are many noise sources inside apart from transconductors, capacitors, what have, what have you. And uh, and therefore, we have already seen how one can calculate 
the output noise spectral density. If I know the topology of the filter as well as the strength of each noise source, I can find the output noise spectral density and the mean square output noise. Okay. Now, one question that would be asked especially by uh, a user of the filter, see a user of the filter uh, hardly cares about the noise sources inside and you know the transfer function from each noise to the to the output, all right. All he or she cares about is, is the total output noise, okay or in other words or another alternate thing which is uh, saying you can think of this noisy filter right let us say the output noise spectral density due to all these sources is V s V out of n. Okay. We can think of this noisy filter as a noiseless filter. with a single noise source put in series with the input. You understand? Right? The question is, okay, there are two questions here. First, how do you find Vx? Okay, and two, why is it useful? Pardon? Vx results in the same noise spectral at the noiseless filter output. In other words, the effect of Vx is to have I mean in other words uh, Vx is equivalent to all those multiple sources inside the filter. Okay, In other words you are trying to replace these multiple noise sources by one source which is equivalent to all these multiple noise sources. So, it is quite logical to call Vx the what? Equivalent input preferred noise source. The only way you can characterize the input preferred noise source is through its spectral density. If you want the effect of Vx <coughs> to be the same as all these multiple noise sources, what should you do? How will you find Svx of f? Svfx times mod h of f, the whole square must be This is known because you know the topo filter topology and so on. This is known because you know the filter response. Okay, so you can determine SVX of f. The question is, why is this useful? This is a useful description, especially when uh, 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 I mean, obviously, this, um, in, uh, in in most practical situations, the filter is going to go into a larger system. You understand? So the system designer doesn't really care about. I mean individual noise source, he can't be worrying about your transistor uh, you know M4 in uh, page 4 of your circuit diagram, right. He just he, he just wants the bottom line which is what is the maximum signal it can handle, what is the noise performance of the filter, right. And given that uh, I mean and uh, so given that <coughs> uh, this filter is most likely going to be driven by some other block, 
in order to estimate or to understand how much the filter degrades performance of the whole entire system why will the filter degrade performance of the system it's adding its noise correct so to figure out how much the filter degrades the uh, performance of the system it makes sense to to compare the input referred noise spectral density of the filter to the signal to the to the spectrum of the signal driving the driving the filter itself you understand okay one could also come i mean as uh, somebody was pointing out said it seems to be much easier to just deal with sv out of f right and both of these are equivalent is sv in of f is just simply vx of f is is uh, in many times convenient simply because it allows you to compare it directly to the spectral characteristics of the signal driving the filter if you had sv out of f of course it's a trivial, it's a trivial matter to determine uh, svx of f but you could also if you know the input spectrum driving the filter or the nature of the signal driving the filter you multiply that by mod h of f the whole square to figure out how that signal will appear at the output of the filter and compare it to the output noise of the filter both input referred noise and output noise of the filter are useful i mean are uh, are equivalent once you know mod h of f and uh, you know depending on um, uh, you know how you want to make calculations you know uh, both are commonly used okay all that i want to point out is a it is possible to determine a single the, the strength of a single noise source applied at the input of the filter which has the same effect as a whole bunch of noise sources inside the filter is that clear all right now that we are done with all this let's get back to the real stuff which is the dynamic range of a filter and uh, you know we have seen specifically we have seen the only filter real active filter we have seen is the second order gmc section correct so let's start with that gm1 minus gm2 c1 c2 gm3 minus gm4 okay which is the low pass node across c1 or c2 c2 vlp of s uh, what is uh, which is the band pass node okay what is the dc gain of the low pass filter okay let's try and find the low pass filter transfer function right vlp of s by vi of s is of the form some constant divided by s square by omega p square plus s by omega p qp plus 1 okay let's now times adc right okay so what is omega p don't turn your pages you should be able to take a look at this and is uh, square root of gm1 gm2 by c1 c 
all right what is qp qp is r divided by square root of l by c and what is r it's 1 by gm 4 square root of l is c2 by gm 1 gm 2 and this must be divided by c1 so qp must therefore be square root of c1 by c2 <coughs> times square root of gm1 gm2 by gm okay what is the dc gain is it gm3 by gm2 or gm2 by gm3 okay you don't know let's try and figure it out we already know that this is the band pass node so what is the potential of that node at dc zero so if i apply a voltage what current flows here at dc we are this potential is zero so this current must be what zero correct and this current is zero because of uh, a capacitor being open at dc so all this current must go where this way correct if current must flow like this what must be this uh, and what must this current be this must be gm3 into vi so what must this voltage be gm3 vi by gm correct so what's the dc gain what's the dc gain gm3 by gm okay you understand all right so now let's say we are given the job of designing a filter a second order low pass filter with a dc gain okay please note i have under the underlined want because i don't want somebody to ask me 3 uh, 15 minutes down the line why why should uh, dc gain be equal to 1 i just want it to be 1 that's all okay it could have been some arbitrary number but i just chosen it to be one or somebody has told you that hey i want a low pass filter with a gain of one and some omega p is given some qp is given correct and he says yeah uh, go ahead and uh, tell me the component values okay so how will you go about the problem you understand somebody comes to you and says i want the second order low pass filter with this omega p and this qp okay and uh, or let let's say he gets even more specific and says i want a second order butterworth low pass filter with uh, omega p is some blah 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 what is qp qp for a second order butterworth is what 1 by root 2 all right so and i want a dc gain of 1 all right and i want i mean uh, i want a transconductor capacitor filter this is the topology we already know this now the question is how will i what is the next step what should i do no 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 first you must think right how many do you expect a unique solution or not yes no no unique solution why okay so there are only three constraints 
and six quantities to determine. So there obviously must be an infinite set of solutions. And uh, you know, one way of generating an infinite array of, solution, uh, array of solutions is to take one solution, let us say a particular GM1, GM2, GM3, GM4, C1 and C2 satisfy our constraints which is ADC equal to 1 and omega p and q p are whatever right uh, we want. Then n into this which is an impedance scale network of the original will also satisfy this thing okay. So what do you think what benefit do you think uh, in other words if n becomes a large number what do you think uh, uh, happens I mean what uh, all the transconductors have gotten multiplied by n all the capacitors have gotten multiplied by n. So what do you think uh, what benefit do you think I have got? The mean square one thing we must expect is that if I increase all transconductors by n and all capacitor sizes by n the mean square noise at the output of the filter must go down by a factor of n okay all right. So, so clearly if I do not specify you know uh, uh, anything it is I mean uh, you know so the uh, the designer might give you a solution with uh, with uh, infinite capacitors right you never know right. So a designer will also say I mean a practical situation will say hey I want omega p q p and a dc gain but I cannot allow you to take the whole world to put your capacitors right there is a limit on the on the on the area your filter can occupy on a chip in other words there is also a limit on and typically the transistors are very small. So equivalently you can say that there is a limit on the size of the capacitors. What is the size of the capacitors I do not really care you know how much is C1 and how much is C2 as a user I only say the whole filter must occupy no more than this much space in other words C1 plus C2 must be less than or equal to C max all right with the understanding therefore that what is the understanding? The understanding is that uh, you know you cannot go on impedance scaling the, uh, the network right you have only finite amount of space and therefore there is only finite amount of capacitance you can fit into that space within those these constraints please give me whatever you know uh, you want right and whatever meets the spec. Now do you think there are infinite number of solutions or the only there is only a unique solution there is still an infinite number of solutions and why is that you know and determine you need to determine six quantities you have only four constraints okay. So now the question is are some set of solutions better than the other set of solutions is this clear? Pardon okay so all right so just hold on a second all right so now given that we have more constraints than equations let us try and figure out other sets of potential solutions which are equivalent as far as the transfer function is concerned. What is the peak gain at the bandpass node? What is the peak gain at the bandpass node? GM3 by GM4. Why does that make sense? At omega p, 
the uh, inductor and the capacitor resonate. So, the peak gain at the band pass node must be gm3 by gm4. Let us all I mean to the circuit diagram let us put in a constraint uh, already saying that gm2 and gm3 must be the same. So, I will make this gm2. So, this will force the DC gain to be always 1. Is that clear? Okay. Now, let us say we have chosen somehow a you know gm1, gm2, gm4, c1 and c2 so that they satisfy our constraints in other I mean the requirements. In other words, square root of gm1, gm2 by c1, c1, c2 must be equal to omega p and uh, you know the, uh, the, uh, the relationship for q is also satisfied and so on. So, in other words, assume gm1, gm2, gm4, c1 and c2 satisfy the specifications correct I mean let us say we have somehow come up with this uh, so given that there are infinite solutions it is not difficult to come up with one solution right so let us say we have somehow come up with this one solution all right. Now so for this particular solution the uh, the the peak value of the band pass response here will be gm2 by gm4 all right <coughs> now do you think it is possible to increase the band pass gain without affecting the low pass gain <coughs> yes you can increase gm2 pardon yes 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 yeah so there are many ways I mean is this the only unique way of doing it or there are other ways of doing it yeah so there are uh, there are many so there are many ways of uh, so if I wanted to increase the peak gain of the band pass response right I mean what I am trying to do is to show you that many solutions exist apart from just simply the impedance scale version right many ways of choosing the remaining parameters exist which will still result in the same DC gain, the same omega naught and the same Q alright. Somebody is waiting there. So, all that I am trying to demonstrate is apart from the impedance scale solution, there are other solutions which could give you the same DC gain, the same omega naught and the same Q alright. And uh, to that end I am saying uh, I mean uh, what, what can another solution mean? Another solution means that the band pass response gain must the only thing it if you want see if this has to be band pass and this has to be the same low pass same omega naught the same Q right. The only thing that can happen with respect to the other solution right is the band pass gain can change why? because the denominator of the band pass and the low pass must remain the same correct and the numerator must be of the form s by omega p because it is a band pass response. So, the only change that can happen right if, if I found another alternate solution of component values the only difference between that solution and the original solution right would be that the gain of the band pass response has changed from the gain in the in the first uh, in the first solution is that clear because by definition 
the low pass responses have remained identical. If the low pass response remains identical, the band pass and the low pass have the same denominator. So, the band pass denominator must remain the same. The band pass numerator must be of the form s by omega p. So, if something changes, it can only be in the gain of the band pass response. Okay. There are several ways of changing the gain of the band pass response. Okay. All right. Well, and you can understand it in the following way. The voltage, the band pass response, uh, the, the band pass voltage is nothing but the voltage across C1. The voltage across C1 is nothing but the current that flows through C1 multiplied by the the impedance of the capacitor which is 1 by SC1, correct. So, if you want to scale up the band pass response, in other words, if you want to scale up this character, the voltage across this character, there are at least two ways of doing it and what are these ways? The voltage is, not, I mean the voltage across the capacitor is nothing but the current flowing into the capacitor times the impedance of the capacitor. If you want to scale up the voltage, there are two at least two ways of doing it. One, you can increase the current flowing into the capacitor and two, or reduce the capacitance value, right. In both cases, the magnitude of the voltage across the capacitor will increase or you can, you know, choose some combination of increasing current as well as reducing capacitance. So, in other words, you have this capacitor, you have many currents coming into yes Dinesh, yeah, yeah I, I mean of course uh, you can't randomly change the capacitance, right. You have to worry about what happens uh, to the transfer. I mean, you must do all this without changing the the low pass transfer function. Correct. So, in general, please note the following. Every capacitor has got multiple current sources feeding into it. One or more current sources feeding into the capacitor, and this capacitor voltage is being sensed by one or more transconductors. For example, in C1, how many current sources are feeding into C1? This current, this current and this current. Okay. And how many transconductors are sensing the voltage across C1? Gm1? No, please look carefully. Gm4 is also sensing the voltage across the capacitor. What about C2? How many currents are feeding into the capacitor? Only one and only one is sensing, correct. So, for any transconductor capacitor network, you will find that you will be able to, every capacitor has got currents flowing, you know, uh, into the capacitor, correct. And this voltage across the capacitor is also being sensed by multiple transconductors. You understand? Okay. Alright, and this is so this is some note C. Now if I want to increase the magnitude response at this node. In other words, if you want to scale up the response at this node, right? One thing I can do is to what can I do? Let's say this is I1, I2, I3, and so on. One way of doing it is to scale up all the currents pushing into this capacitor. Correct? Then what will happen to this, what will happen to the node potential there? 
it will scale, scale up by by let's say I scale up all these currents by alpha then what will happen to the response uh, at what will tend to happen to the response at C all it will go up by alpha. However, please note as uh, somebody pointed out that this is these current sources are going to the rest of the network correct. Now if you want nothing elsewhere to get disturbed what should you do? You want to make sure that if nothing must happen elsewhere, I mean in other words no change must happen elsewhere, what you must do is that you must make sure that these currents remain the same. You understand? Alright? Okay, I mean if, so in other words if you have a roommate and uh, <laughs> If you want to think the world, uh, if you want the world to think that uh, whether you guys are good friends and don't fight often, what should you do? You close the room doors and then uh, you know uh, yell at each other, right? And uh, when you are uh, not yelling at each other, you can open the rooms and then everybody says, "Oh, what a nice bunch of roommates," you know, that kind of thing, right? So whatever happens must happen only here. Nothing must happen. The rest of the world must think that life remains the same. It's like our campus, you know, we really do not care what happens outside as long as stuff runs smoothly inside, hmm? okay, all right. <coughs> so uh, nothing must happen, if nothing must, uh, if the rest of the network must behave like it did earlier, all that you must make sure is that if earlier these transconductors were uh, GM1, GM2, etc. Then these transconductors must be the currents that must flow must be the same, but the inputs to these the, the voltage that is being sensed by these transconductors has gone up by a factor alpha. So the transconductors must be divided by alpha in order for the currents to remain the same. Correct? Alternately, one can also do the following. What can I do? If I want to push the voltage up, I reduce the capacitance by alpha. The voltage has gone up. Right, and uh, so what should I do if the rest of the world must think all is well? Transconductors must be divided by alpha. You leave it like this. You understand? So this is a way in which the response at one particular node can be scaled up by a factor alpha without. disturbing the rest of the network. In other words, the transfer function from uh, uh, the input to some other node has not changed at all <coughs> if you did this, correct? If the transfer, transfer function has not changed, what does that mean about the poles and all that? The poles of the network have remained the same. Yes, sir? So if you want to increase the, uh, if you want to scale up only the response at this node by a factor alpha, one way of doing it as we just discussed is for example to reduce this by alpha, correct? That will tend to push the voltage up, but you want all the currents that flowing elsewhere to be the same. So all the transconductors which sense this capacitor voltage must be scaled down. So what should happen? GM1 must go down by alpha. Okay. What about uh, GM4? Well, 
correct so let me illustrate with uh, I mean, let, let me draw a cleaner diagram if i wanted to multiply this up by alpha one strategy to choose if we want to only meddle with the capacitance is to keep <coughs> reduce c1 by alpha and and uh, you have to change gm1 to gm1 by alpha okay and this must become minus gm4 by does it make sense okay so now what has happened to the inductor value the inductor value is increased by factor alpha but the capacitance has decreased by factor alpha so the resonant frequency omega p remains the same right and you can also show that the q uh, if the l has increased by factor alpha and c is decreased by the factor alpha what has happened to square root of l by c L has gone up by alpha, C has gone down by alpha. What has happened to square root L by C? Has gone up by a factor alpha, right? So, but and what has happened to the damping resistor? Increased also by a factor alpha. So, the Q remains the same, okay? At resonance, what is happening now? The DC gain, please note, remains the same. Of the, the DC gain of the low pass filter remains the same. What happens with the band pass node at resonance? The C1 by alpha and the inductor resonate. So, all the current pumped by GM2 flows in through the re resistor of value alpha by GM4, which means that the band pass response has gotten scaled up by a factor alpha. Is this clear? Okay. So, this is what this procedure I mean I have only done this at <coughs> at the band pass node this can be applied to I mean uh, if I wanted to keep the band pass gain fixed for example and if I wanted to fool around with the low pass gain then I could do the same thing with the low pass also does it make sense so this procedure <coughs> is called node scaling okay where the frequency response at one particular node is scaled up by a factor alpha if uh, there are let's say uh, let's say we cascaded uh, two of such filters to realize a composite fourth order low pass filter then i mean as far as the user is concerned is only going to say that i want the dc gain from the input to the output to be let's say 1 okay but he doesn't say anything about what the output the, the dc gain of the first low pass section is and uh, the uh, band pass gains he doesn't specify correct so this node scaling can be applied to three nodes in a fourth order filter if you are interested only keeping the gain and the response from the input to the output fixed the the uh, the gains of the responses at the intermediate nodes can be all change arbitrarily right by while still keeping the input to output transfer function the same by the use of node scale right and there is not there is no rocket science here you could have uh, written down the formula for omega naught and q and then you will find that there are only you know for example three constraints and there are like you know 18 equations to uh, uh, yeah, to solve right and you can choose this you know in all sorts of random ways but this is an you know uh, i mean the only difference between all these solutions will be the scale factors at each one of these does it make sense 
Okay. Now, what is the question to ask? A good question to ask is can we stop now and I think that is uh, it's quite okay. I think it is already very long today. We will continue in the next class. Do you understand?